Well, happy spring. We are like almost there. So we're glad you're with us today and you'll get to enjoy uh, being outside in just a little bit. If you're on the lakeside room, family room, if you're joining us on Facebook Live or through the website, we're glad you're with us as well. Today, we're going to be looking at Acts 27. We are almost through the book of Acts. Next week, Adam will be here. I'll be downtown. We'll be finishing up the book. And uh, after that, we'll be going into our Easter series. Can you believe we're this close to Easter already? It feels like the year's flying by. We're going to follow Easter with a series that's going to deal with some hot topics going on in our culture today. A lot of people see the Bible as some nice historical literature for back then. But how many of you know the Bible speaks to what's going on today? And it speaks to what is going on in our culture. We're going to deal with some very hot button topics uh, in, for about six weeks uh, following Easter. I uh, also want to tell you, so this week as we look at Acts 27, we will be seeing Paul getting on a ship and going through a horrific storm. And I want to encourage you, some of you, this message may hit home today, but in a little bit I'll explain why. I kind of call this a back pocket sermon because eventually all of us hit certain seasons in life where this information is helpful. Um, before getting there, how many of you get motion sickness? Anyone? Oh, okay. This one's going to be a fun one for you then. I never did. And then all of a sudden I hit about 40, 45 and things started changing in my inner ear and just balance and everything. Every other year I'd go with my youngest son. He is a roller coaster fanatic. So we go to Cedar Point. Some amusement parks play with roller coasters. Cedar Point doesn't play. They build, if they're going to build something, it's going to be the fastest and the tallest and the biggest drop and the most inverted. It's going to be the one that just flings you into the air and you hold on to nothing. I mean, it is, it is all about the thrill when you go there. Well, the last time we went, I don't know why, but all of a sudden I had a horrific problem with motion sickness. And that's all I'm going to tell you <laughs> for your own sake. But I had, I'd never had that before. And... You know, we'll look today at Paul going through this storm. Now, some of you already at this point in the message, you're like, okay, motion sickness, got it. You're getting old, check. Uh, Paul's in a boat, uh, about to go through a storm, file that away for like a trivial pursuit later. No, I, I need you to understand, when we are talking about a storm here, we're not talking about a nice little rain that hits. The passage says it's days in a storm. This is not something that you easily paddle through. Let's put the pictures up. I want you to picture being on something like this. And those of you motion sickness, you may need to leave, look away every once in a while. People last night started turning green. So imagine being on a wooden boat and not a cruise liner. We're talking about a prisoner's boat. So Paul is on this boat on the dock. There's very little to do going under the boat. And he's watching waves come over the top, not a metal ship. He's watching all, everything begin to toss around him. I'm going to read the passage. And I want you to listen with this picture in mind, beginning at verse 13. The first 12 verses or so just talks about some different cities they stopped through. But beginning at verse 13, it says, When a gentle south wind began to blow... They saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a hurricane force called a nor'easter, northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed the ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sardis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. As you see what's going on here, think of the words that are used in this passage, words like we took a violent battering. 
The storm continued raging. We gave up all hope of being saved. This is a hurricane force wind. And I want you to think, Paul's on the side of the boat. That is a beautiful sight. Paul's on the side of this boat holding on. They're trying to keep the boat together. They're taking on water. For what? For Paul to get to Rome and go on trial. What usually happens when people go on trial in Rome? They don't live to see the next day. I got to wonder if Paul's looking at this going, you know, I could just accidentally fall off the side of this boat and it would just be over. It'd be done. I've taken beatings. I've sat in jail. I've gone through all of this mess trying to ride out this storm. And now I'm watching the waves. Think of the critters that are underneath those waves just waiting on you. Paul's hitting the heart of this storm. Today we're going to look at what we can learn from all of this as well. We'll now shift from the video to the first point. Here's the first point. There will be storms. Expect them. There will be storms. Expect them. Last night I had someone come up to me and they said, I can't even think of the last time I wasn't in a storm. Someone else said, it seems like storms are the normal part of life and the sunny days are the breaks in between the storms. Storms are a normal part of life. Anywhere you live on this planet, there is inclement or harsh weather that can kill you. Storms are a normal thing. If someone were to come up to you next December, look out the window and go, hmm, I bet we're going to get snow in the next 90 days or so, and I bet it's going to get a little cold too. What would be your response? No kidding. Did you go to meteorology school for that? When we lived in Florida, if I would have gone up in the morning and said in May, June, July, or August, September, said, wow, it's going to be a scorcher today, but it's going to be a little toasty, you'd say, no kidding. You better put on some sunscreen. You better have some water with you. There's challenging weather everywhere. Storms hit. You need to expect them. Now, I say this, and some of you, here's the hard part, some of you hear me talk about that in in a natural setting or in nature, and you say, that makes sense, but I say that in regard to life, and some of you, that may sound a bit overwhelming. When I was younger, I kept thinking, you know, a storm would hit, and I would think, if I can just make it through this storm, the rest of my life will be smooth sailing. If I can make it through this next season, I would tell Gina, it's only a short window, it's only going to happen for a little while, then everything in life will be perfect. Storms, for many people, become the norm. And I would venture to say, if I asked around the room, how many of you have been in a season of life or a storm that lasted more than a week or a month or a year? Many of us would raise our hands. Some of you, and I won't ask for a show of hands on this, but some of you, if I were to ask you, how many of you went through a storm where you thought, I don't know if I can survive this one. I don't know if I can ride this one out. Others of you, if I ask the question, you may say, I don't know that I want to ride this out. I'm tired. I'm done. I'm I'm seasick from the storm. I haven't eaten. I've lost my strength. I've given up hope. Storms are a reality. We need to expect them. We need to understand that it's part of life. You may be afraid of getting washed overboard. Part of you at that point may get to the point where you just don't care. You almost hope to get the worst over with. Two weeks ago, I went to visit someone in a hospital and they had a a family member, they call a friend, they called him a family member who was right at the edge of life and death. And we prayed with him and the, the doctor came in and said, you have to make the choice. And they chose to pull the plug and remove the tubes. And the person looked at me and said, So there's no miracle. What do you say? I can give you a nice preacher speech. I can tell you about the pearly gates and the joys of heaven and all of that is true. Maybe not the pearly gates, but the joys of heaven and the eternal life that we have that we get to look forward to. But what is that in the moment of the storm when the waves are smacking against your face and you feel like the boat's about to roll and it's coming apart underneath you? Storms are a reality and we need 
to expect them. Now, it's going to go from bad to worse for just a second, so bear with me, because in the storm, you need to get ready to lose some stuff. In the storm, you need to get ready to lose some stuff, and many times, it's the stuff you've relied on in the past. Acts 27 18, verse 18 and 19, it says, we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. They were taking on so much water, all the stuff they thought was gonna be important in the long run, they start chucking over the side of the boat. In a little bit, we're gonna read, they start throwing their food over the side of the boat. Anything that would weigh it down, had to go. When I've gone through storms, as things are eroding and as the, the waves are pounding, I'm watching things that I thought were important to me, I thought should have been the most important to me. I'm watching them being washed away and I'm asking God, like, maybe you have at times, God, why me? Why now? Why am I going through this? Maybe if you're like me, you've gotten to that low place where you go, okay, God, what did I do? How can I make this right? I want to tell you, God's not petty. But we go through this stuff, and I am not God. I cannot fully answer these questions, but I've learned a few things from going through storms. I want to share two of them with you. Here's the first one. Sometimes we go through it and lose some stuff that we had in the place where God should have been all along. We put some places, things in places where God should have been all along. Sometimes our storms have been self-made by a habit that got us busted, an addiction where we finally hit a wall. Something that had far more of our life than it should have or something we were sneaking because it should have had no place in our life at all. Sometimes it's a pride that got to the point where the storm what it was inevitable. People saw more of our attitude than results or our heart. Those storms will hit, and sometimes God allows them to hit. So I was 23 years old, and I had just about a year or two been in, in youth ministry, and I graduated from college, which of course said I had a piece of paper that said I was smarter than all of you. And I was a little full of myself went into our first youth ministry role, and it was awesome. God did some really cool things, but along the way, I knew God was doing it, but of course, I was there. You're welcome, God. So, and I, I got a little bit too much Jack involved in the situation, so I left one position for another in a city that I'd rather be in in what seemed like a better environment. And I got there, and the storms hit. And with a less than two-year-old and a baby on the way, we had to leave our home, we couldn't stay in it, and move in with my in-laws. Pray for me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've been blessed with great in-laws, but, but not the situation you want to be in. And my wife and my mother-in-law had gone back to our home to pack it up. We were getting ready to rent it out and then try and sell it. And my father and I were at home alone at his home alone and, and he's a godly man not one with a ton of words but I was whining 23 years old and I'm telling him how good I am at what I do and I'm telling him how I have this degree and I'm telling him that I don't know why all this is going on and my words of what he said but what he said to me was well maybe if you weren't so full of yourself and got off your high horse you'd be in a position where God could use you well tell me how you really feel Sometimes God allows these storms to say, hey, you're not all that. Get your eyes back on me. I was in another season of life at one point where we had left a ministry role and I still thought, you know, I can push through this and I can do it. And I, there was a group of people, they were meeting in a storefront. They had no pastor. I offered to go and speak for free. And they said, no. <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> It's those moments where you're, you lose things, you lose identity, you lose position. Maybe in some cases you lose someone you thought you could never get beyond. You lose a title you thought was the most important thing of who you were. You lose a job that you thought, that's my source of income, not God. I've worked hard, I've gotten here. I deserve this. Storms hit 
And they remind us of who's really in charge. Will we worship him or will we worship the stuff being washed off the boat? God is asking, will you worship me or the position that we feel we're losing? Lord, I was there first. I'm better at it. It's not fair. Storms aren't fair. Can you repeat that with me? Storms aren't fair. The Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust, the good and the bad, the holy and the person in jail for life. Storms aren't fail, aren't fair. One person said this week, I heard this quote, I loved it. Religious people face challenges with arrogance. Jesus people face challenges with humility. Do we really believe it's God who exalts and removes? The psalmist, Psalm 119, verse 71, David writes, it is good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. David says, it's good that I've gone through this stuff because this is when I really lean into you. God, when I'm sitting on the beach with a bunch of friends and the weather is perfect and everything is fine, very seldom am I on my face going, Lord, what do you want from me? Holy Spirit, speak to me. But when the storm hits, when I've been afflicted, I tend to push in in a way like I never have before. And I wouldn't in any other circumstance. It's good for me, David said. It's good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. I might dig in to what's really important. God is asking, will you worship me or will you worship her? Will you worship me or will you worship him? Will you worship that house or will you worship me. God's asking the question, and some of you, you hear that and you think, I've got the biggest house I've ever had, and there's not a single happy person in it. I open the door to my home, and I walk in to a tornado. It's when the storm hits and you begin to lose things, you'll find out where your heart truly is. As one person said, when you hit rock bottom, at least then you've hit solid ground. Will we worship him or will we worship it? And some of you right now, you've got a storm stirring on the inside of you because there's some stuff you just don't want to let go of. There's some people you just don't want to let go of. There's a title. There's a ministry that you just don't want to let go of. The storm hits all of us. In the storm, you may lose stuff, but don't lose your praise to God. Verse 35 of the chapter says, Paul It says he took some bread and he gave thanks to God in front of them all. Paul's a prisoner. He's been abused. He's been mistreated. He's on a prisoner's boat in the middle of the storm. And what does the passage say he does? He stops. He gives thanks to God. Wind is smacking him. Waves washing over him. He gives thanks to God for the bread that he has. I wonder if we got the game film of the last storm that we've gone through in our life. If we played that film back, if we would stop it and go, there it is. There's the moment where they trusted God and saw God as bigger than their storm. The storm is going on and yet Paul says, God, thank you. Thank you for what you've blessed me with. God sees that moment where we see him as bigger than our storm. We've trusted him as bigger than a person or a role or a position or a relationship or a paycheck or a challenge that you may be facing. It goes on to say, end of verse 35, end of 36, it says, then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. Paul is not the captain. Paul is not the centurion. Paul's not even like a fisherman or someone who's been at sea by trade. Paul's a tent maker. And yet 276 people find their hope and their encouragement in what? In seeing Paul worship and thank God in the middle of the storm. How we handle things says a lot about how big we see our God being. 
God's in it all with you, no matter how it turns out. Here's the second thing I've learned in this. Remember this. Most of the time, God will use our storms and our enemies to grow us in not normal days of living in sun and hanging out with buddies. You may have someone in your life right now and you're like, God, they are the bane of my existence. That teacher, that boss, that family member. I don't know how I'm going to put up with them. They may be the very storm God is putting in your life to say, what are you hanging on to? You know what you need to do when you go to work tomorrow? Grab your boss's hand. Thank you. Thank you for being the person you are. Don't explain it. Just say it. Thank you for being the person you are. God is using you in my life. You're welcome. God can sometimes, God will use our enemies and some of the worst situations to deepen us. Trees, plants grow deeper in the winter so they survive the storms of summer. Your greatest breakthrough may come in times and in, well, around people who will challenge you most. Storms are inevitable. They're going to come. You're going to lose some things as you go through it. But here's our next blank. Even when things are falling apart, God is still in it. He provides a way, even if it's by one plank. God is still in it. Listen to these verses. They'll be up on the screens as well. David writes in Psalm 139, verse 7, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me, in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Philippians chapter 4, second half of verse 11 through verse 13. Paul writes, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Another translation of the passage says, I can endure all this through him who gives me strength. You can make it through this. Whatever your storm may look like right now, you can endure all things through Christ who gives you strength. I got $7 in my checking account right now with a mortgage due or a rent due, a car payment due, the kids need stuff taken care of. God, I don't know how, but I'll endure. I don't know when you'll come through, but I'll ride this storm out. I've been stuck in the same job forever, but I can endure. My spouse is being less than complimentary, but I can endure. The kids, God, I don't even know what you're doing with them, but I can endure. My church, let me tell you about that one, but I can endure. I can endure all things through Christ who gives me strength. Storms are going to come, but God goes with you through the storm. I could go on and on with examples from life. I can go on and on from scripture. God never promises you won't have storms, but he guarantees he's there with us as we go through them. Sometimes he's saving his most amazing next step for when he's got our full attention in the storm. Matthew 8, Mark, uh, Mark 4, Luke 8, three of the four gospel writers writing about this event. Don't tell me it didn't make a monstrous impression with them. They're all at sea and they're all rowing. Storm rolls in. They don't think they're going to make it. Jesus is asleep on the boat. Jesus, wake up. We're going down. Jesus wakes up. A storm, cut it out. Lay, I'm picturing him laying back down and going to sleep. But every one of them, it got their attention, and obviously they never forgot it. Right in the middle 
of the storm. Matthew 14, Mark 6. Once again, we've got our disciples rowing into, the, into a sea and, and a storm hits. And what happens next? Here comes Jesus walking past them on the water. Kind of freaks them out a little bit. They think it's a ghost. And then Peter is like, hey, can I walk on the water too? Jesus says, come on. Peter's out and walking on the water. Sometimes God gets our attention most when the storm is at its worst. When we feel like we've given up hope on everything else. Once again, let's go back to Paul. Paul, in the middle of this thing, is able to hold on to his praise. He's able to hold on to worship. And because of that, he influences 276 other people. Not as the captain, not as the head of the guard, but as a prisoner. This is like a storm within his storm. Verse 21 chapter 27. It says, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice and not sailed from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. I love that I told you so moment captured in scripture. Verse 22. It says, but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Jump down to verse 30. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. And then verse 34 picks up what we read earlier. Now I urge you, take some food. You need to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from your, his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of all of them. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 on board. You don't know who your storm is influencing right now. You may feel like a nothing, a nobody, a prisoner on a prison ship, one of a bunch. You may feel like you're not in a place of influence or affluence, but how you handle yourself is being seen. There are people who see our lives. You believe in God? You're going through the same mess I am. But how do we go through it? And does it look any different? Can we trust God and praise him in the storm? This brings us to our last point. Remember this. God is there before, during, and after the storm. We've seen, as we just read, verse 24 and 25, where there was a promise made to Paul that God will keep. Verse 43 of chapter 27, it says, he ordered those who could swim. This is the centurion at, at Paul's charge. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and to get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. You may get through your storm by one plank. You're looking at everything you've got together now and your ship looks good and it's loaded with stuff and the storm's gonna hit and you're gonna make it by one plank. Storms are going to hit. But no matter what you're going through, even if you're down to that one plank, remember you're not there alone. God will be with you. Now, I had you say earlier that storms aren't fair. Let's end this with a little bit more positive proclamation. God will be with you. Can you say that with me? God will be with you. Remind the person sitting beside you right now. God will be with you. No matter the result, no matter how big or bad those winds look, God will be with you. There are facts that go with storms. There are waves. There is wind. 
There is water splashing up over the side of the boat, and the boat may be sinking. These are the facts, but here's the truth. God's presence will not leave you or forsake you in the storm. God will be with you. He's there before, during, and after, whether you feel him or you don't. Hang in there and see what the storm is all about. Lean on the Holy Spirit. And remember, his presence is there. At rock bottom, stand on solid ground. And know you don't stand alone. And let's see what God is up to on the other side of this storm. Would you bow your head to me, please? Once again, I call this a back pocket sermon because here's the reality of life. You are either just exiting a storm, coming through the waves, you are in the middle of a storm, that you're wondering how you're going to make it, or you may not know it, but there is a storm cell on the horizon forming as we speak. And God's word will stand true no matter which one of those you're going through. The Bible is true no matter which one of those you face. Let's learn from Paul's experience. Let's learn that God is with us in it. I want to close in prayer this morning for each of us to hold tight when the storm hits, when we feel like we're roping our boat together, when we're wondering what it's all about or God, have you abandoned us in the middle of this mess? And we remember his presence before, during, and after. After service, there'll be prayer partners. Jeff will give you the update, but don't feel like you have to go through the storm alone. Remember, in the middle of it, you can reach out to God, and as church family, we're there. We go through this together. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for your words in the storm that say, peace be still. And Lord, may we own that moment for our own hearts, if nothing else, that in the truth of the waves and the wind and the fear that may be in the air that you can smell from just other people's lives and what's going on, Lord, may we stand and lean on and live by peace, be still. Lord, I pray that we trust you no matter what. I pray for myself in those moments when I couldn't sleep and I've been full of anxiety or fear or tears in the night asking God what are you doing or what are you going to do about it help me to remember that you've got my life beyond any boat you've got my life beyond any circumstance or situation beyond any person beyond anything I may be relying on or anyone I may be relying on beyond you Lord help me to rein it back in and in the middle of the storm, give you praise and remember who you are and whose I am. I thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray.